Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. So welcome to our first Human Rights in Practice event of the semester on transnational activism on reproductive rights. Our event is convened today by the Center for International and Comparative Law and the Duke International Human Rights Clinic. We also have several co-sponsors for today's event, and I see many of you here. One co-sponsor is the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute. And we also have several student groups co-sponsoring as well. The Coalition Against Gendered Violence, the Human Rights Law Society, If, When, How, the International Law Society, Outlaw, and the Women Law Students Association. So thank, thank you all to our co-sponsors, and thank you all for being here. We have two speakers with us today, and we're very excited to welcome both of them. I'll start by introducing Christina Rosero Arteaga, who you see up on our screen. Christina is Senior Legal Advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Center for Reproductive Rights, which is a global legal advocacy organization dedicated to advancing reproductive rights and protecting and promoting reproductive health, self-determination, and dignity as basic human rights. And Christina is based in Bogota, Colombia. Christina worked at the Causa Justa or Fair Cause Movement lawsuit in Colombia before the Constitutional Court, which we'll talk more about today, as well as on the legal and communication strategies that led to the decriminalization of abortion in Colombia in February of this year. She has several years of experience working through strategic litigation and advocacy in several Latin American countries for the protection of reproductive rights and the prevention and attention of various forms of gender-based violence. And our second speaker, who we're very happy to have with us here in person, is Beola Osweke. And Beola is a deputy director of New Voices Reproductive Justice, an organization dedicated to transforming society for the holistic health and well-being of Black women, girls, and gender-expansive people nationally and specifically in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Beulah has an extensive background in community organizing, international network building, and organizational development, with particular focus on utilizing a human rights-centered approach to maximize the genius of marginalized peoples. Beulah is committed to working to ensure the complete wholeness of Black women and Black youth. So a very warm welcome to both of our speakers. And our format tip for today is that we've talked through some questions that I'll ask about Viola and Christina, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions from all of you. So please start planning your questions as well as you listen. So starting with a question to Viola, your work very much centers on community organizing and especially the intersection of community organizing and reproductive justice. Can you first define reproductive justice for us? especially distinguishing it from reproductive health, and also talk about the ways in which you incorporate community organizing as an essential aspect of your reproductive justice work. Well, thank you for the question, and thank you all for being here. That food looks good as hell. <laughs> A little jealous, but I'll, I'm going to make it through. Um, so first, I've been in the reproductive justice movement for about three years now, a little bit over three years. And um, as Aya shared, I come from a racial justice background. And so when I entered the reproductive justice, I learned about the repro workforce, which entails um, three approaches or three frameworks to reproductive liberation and reproductive freedom. One is repro health or healthcare, which looks at the actual services that are offered to women, birthing individuals, uh, gender expansive people, such as abortion care, family counseling, uh, birth control, so that's actually looking at the, the health care services offered. Then you have reproductive rights, which looks at the legality of reproductive health care in the, re, in the health care system in America, ensuring that all um, cis women and uh, birthing individuals have access to the same quality of health care, uh, looking at the law, I guess. And then you have reproductive justice, which really focuses on access and looks at all of the societal contributions that either positively or negatively impact um, one's uh, reproductive system and also their bodily autonomy. And so for me, reproductive justice is much more uh, widely encompassing, it's much more comprehensive, and it focuses uh, on black women, 
uh, black girls, uh, black gender expansive people, with the belief that once you cater to the needs of the most oppressed, then all people's needs are met. And so with Repro Justice, it encompasses uh, climate justice, gun violence, and it really looks at all aspects of state sanctioned violence. Um, I was sharing this with you all last night, that Repro Rights and Repro Health tends to be a, a lot wider, a lot better resource than Repro Justice, which again looks at the aspects of all of our lives. Um, what was the second question again? Um, so talking through how you incorporate community organizing in okay. your work. Yeah, so what was really refreshing for me about reproductive justice as opposed to racial justice or faith-based organizing was that reproductive justice uh, firmly stands in the affirmative, identifying what we deserve, not begging to live. And as a black woman in America, that was extremely refreshing for me because it does not feel humanizing uh, to beg to be seen as a full person, not in 2022, not ever. And so I really appreciate... Um, Speaking with everyday people, community members, people that have three jobs, four jobs, just trying to really survive and support their families, beginning with what they deserve and then helping them see the tools and the steps, the conversations, the connections that are necessary to get what they deserve. So we're not operating as alarmists. We're not making people panic. We're not exploiting people and telling them, here are these really uh, well-resourced people, bleed your heart out so they can give us a couple of pennies. We're creating an image of a new world for them that they will have to be responsible for constructing. And so community organizing really looks at building individual power. So having one-to-ones, identifying self-interest of the person you're speaking with, sharing your self-interest and seeing where there's an overlap of interest, as well as in intentionally building power amongst communities that are told that they have none outside of occasional election cycles. Thank you. And building on that, your work is also, as you've talked about, really grounded in an in intersectional approach. And having come from a racial justice and faith-based activism background, you're really focused on populations that are the most marginalized in a variety of different ways and in taking an intersectional approach to your work. So can you talk about what this intersectional approach looks like in practice? And as you've talked about also how this really achieves the goal of inclusivity as a way to actively resist Yes, absolutely. So I feel like the many identities that we cling to, everyone I'm looking at, I would assume has at least two or more identities that you feel inform your existence and the way that you approach your life. Um, so I feel like identities like any tool, uh, whether we're talking about education, religion, social media, anything, has uh, a way that we, it, we can be impacted positively and also negatively. So whereas identity allows for us to connect with each other without having to have preliminary conversations that if we were talking with someone inside our community or inside our shared identities, we wouldn't have to do. That can become tiresome, cumbersome, laborious. Um, identity also has the opportunity to seclude us, uh, to create silos in ways that if we really have an understanding of the overlap of so many of the oppressive systems that exist in this country and across the globe, we wouldn't even waste time talking about what about this? What about that? So I feel like it is a privilege to be paid to fight for justice of our people. Um, I think that people that are getting paid in movement work get to philosophize, get to innovate in ways that other people wish they could, but they don't. Whether it's uh, because of educational barriers, skill barriers, they just, they just don't have it. So I oftentimes tell my organization, I tell our board, I tell the organizers that I support and manage that to who much is given, much is required. And we really do have to reduce our ego to do this work as well as we can. And there's a constant and daily unlearning that has to happen because so many of us have been convinced of our sense of worthiness according to what is seen as acceptable or the standard populations and everyone else is a subset or an afterthought. That is a lie. But how many of us know that that's a lie? At what age are we told that that's a lie? Many of our parents and guardians actually operated underneath this same false assumption due to capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. And so anyone that thinks that they have arrived when they're doing movement work has already actually started their, um, their downfall because when we look at the vastness of this world and the vastness of the people that we cater to, every conversation holds something for us to learn. So when we're looking at the, the power and the potential of converging our movements as opposed to just operating in individual um, spaces, it's really necessary that we take wisdom, learning, and insights from the conversations that we have that are in climate justice or that are in criminal justice 
and bring them to a core framework, which is what I really believe that reproductive justice encompasses. Um, if anyone was in the class I spoke to last Friday, apologies for being redundant, but I spoke with someone that said that she is not in 50 different fights, she's in one fight with 50 different rounds. And I have never been able to think of this work otherwise since then. Uh, turning to you, Christina. So turning to Colombia, on February 21st of this year, the Constitutional Court of Colombia issued a decision decriminalizing abortion up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Abortion after 24 weeks is also legal under designated grounds, including when a pregnancy poses a risk to the health or the life of the pregnant person, is non-viable, or is a result of rape. Christina, can you talk us through the significance of this decision, please? First, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm so excited to be able to talk to you and also to learn from Julia also because it's been an amazing uh, conversation so far. So yes, in Colombia, we had um, a regulation before in since 2006, uh, also because of a decision from the Constitutional Court in which um, it was established that uh, access to safe abortion was permitted in only three circumstances when was a risk to the health, including mental health, uh, to the pregnant person, uh, when the fetus was unviable, and when the pregnancy was the result of rape or incest. Uh, for 15 years, uh, several groups uh, worked hard on this implementation of these three exceptions, but uh, for us it was clear with time that having a dual nature as a right and as a crime uh, regarding abortion was generating serious barriers, especially to women's access to this service, even in the three circumstances. Uh, despite the, the fact that some of them uh, had the requirements to access to abortion legally, they faced several barriers in the service. So for us, uh, as a movement, uh, this started as a conversation on people working in several uh, changes around this implementation, like uh, education, that uh, local organizing, or um, working on uh, strategic litigation around this issue. And for all of us, it was clear that the three exceptions weren't enough and didn't comply to the needs of women and girls in Colombia. So this is the way the Causa Justa movement conversation started, uh, led especially by the uh, 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 one uh, organization that is called La Mesa por la Vida y la Salud de las Mujeres, the Round Table for Women's Health and Life. And this conversation started like, this is not enough. What can we do to go farther? We need to decriminalize abortion, not only on the litigation, but also um, uh, socially. We need to overcome stigma around this issue. And for us, that was the start of, of this movement and all the, all the, all the developments that we, we accomplished after. This is a historic uh, step to guarantee the reproductive rights for women, girls, and persons with gestational capacity, because this creates a, a significant change on the legal framework in Colombia. First, uh, this considered a, a big uh, standard for uh, allowing people to uh, reach the healthcare system, um, even though I have to clarify that actually the movement weren't going for a specific amount of weeks or, a, or this type of model. For us, the conversation in the movement was actually to talk about the importance of not regulating abortion via the criminal code. For us, it would be important only regulated via um, uh, through the regulations on the healthcare system with a human rights perspective and with a gender perspective. Uh, but uh, the Constitutional Court had uh, some internal discussions and they end up with this uh, decision. For us, even though it wasn't exactly with what we look for, uh, it's uh, anyway a really huge advance. And of course, now Colombia is an example for the entire region because we had the better uh, model right now with a better uh, time frame for women and girls to come to the uh, healthcare system. And as you mentioned in the in the question, uh, after that uh, 24 week uh, time uh, frame, uh, you, you can always also uh, access to abortion in these three exceptions that were already approved 
in 2006. Um, for us, it's also really important as a message, as a strong message uh, within the country regarding the citizenship of women and girls and um, also an, e an equality uh, discussion for us. Because the fact that abortion was still in the penal code, um, for us, it was a, a good, important uh, conversation to give because the fact that it's criminalized that way means that the state and the law is in the middle of the decisions and the autonomy for women and girls. And that for us as a movement and as feminists wasn't something acceptable. And for us, this process was also really important to create a public conversation around the respect for the autonomy of women, girls and people with a gestational capacity. So this was a huge opportunity to go further also in that decriminalization, to overcome a stigma around abortion and to talk about especially the, the inequalities that were created by the three exceptions before. So for us, of course, this is a historical decision and we are really committed to the um, implementation of the ruling, but also to keep fighting for taking abortion off the criminal code and uh, hopefully in some future. Thank you, Christina. And as you mentioned, it was Causa Justa or the Fair Cause Movement that was really instrumental in bringing this lawsuit. And this movement was made up of about 100 organizations and 150 activists in the country. And I know, Christina, you played a key role in this litigation. Can you talk about your work in the litigation, including some of the opportunities and challenges of working with such an enormous movement consisting of so many organizations and individuals? Yes, thank you so much. For uh, I was part of the group of lawyers who uh, draft the lawsuit, uh, but Causa Justa, it's a, it's a way bigger movement with a lot of diverse organizations and activists uh, this is a, a movement that is already in more than 15 cities in the country. And we, uh, as, a, as a movement, started this conversation trying to bring together all people working on sexual and reproductive rights. Because uh, this is not a new conversation in Colombia. We worked on the really important work that was already made decades ago by several groups before. And the thing that changed with Causa Justa was the fact that now we were all talking together and start to coordinate actions towards the same objective. And that was uh, basically how we enhanced the work that already was being made, but becoming more powerful and creating a cause, a specific cause to talk about this issue um, in a more broad way. So for us, it was uh, quite interesting to work because within the movement, we created specialized groups to work on different strategies. I was, of course, part of the legal group in which we were uh, leading the litigation, thinking on the best arguments to bring to the constitutional court and which were the strategies behind this judicial process. But the rest of the movement was focusing on our main goal, with, which is social decriminalization, uh, social decriminalization of abortion. So there were a group. Uh, there's a group regarding communications strategy, who thought in audiences and different strategies to bring our messages to all people in Colombia, young people, older people, people who could influence the judges um, within the constitutional court. We also had groups on the social mobilizations within the regions and the territories in Colombia, in which we talked about what strategies we should use uh, with our partners in the cities to bring this conversation also to the territories and to uh, make out of this a uh, national movement, a truly national movement uh, talking about abortion. So um, for me, the experience was amazing because I, I had the opportunity to work on these legal strategies but also to realize that law is just a small part of all this work in the activism. Uh, we, we had to recognize that the change in the law, of course, creates uh, some advances, but we don't have everything win with uh, only the law and only the legislation changing. Uh, for us, this was most, it was really important to create a public a conversation around it to overcome the stigma, to bring the stories of women and girls who needed access to this service 
to the public light uh, and to make everyone to understand why it was needed to eliminate this crime from the penal code. And, and that was part of our, our uh, I think, our success. And is the fact that this wasn't like behind the back of the people. This was a really public conversation. Everyone was involved. And we, of course, had to anticipate a lot of attacks and opposition. But we were willing to do so because it is needed to bring this to light and to have an open and honest conversation with good arguments and evidence about this issue. And I think that's one of the main goals of Causa Justa. And of course, it helped a lot to bring the best arguments to the Constitutional Court to secure a successful um, outcome of this project. Thank you. And now back to you, Eula. In a statement that your organization released after Dodds, um, the organization noted, and I'll quote, through community care, organizing, and public education, we will ensure that those most affected by the violent assaults of white supremacy, patriarchy, transphobia, and poverty have space where they feel informed and safe, end quote. Can you share more about these strategies of community care, organizing, and public education and what that looks like in practice? And then secondly, what it means to really center um, struggles of those who are most affected by white, white supremacy, patriarchy, transphobia, and poverty. Yes, I might ask you to repeat that second question. Yeah, we can okay. start with the first. <laughs> okay, uh, the first one was how we go about offering community care. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was actually sharing this in conversation with you all, all night, but I'm actually very critical of uh, progressive spaces and progressive um, identified people because I feel like it's very easy for us to get comfortable, especially when we're not up against a lot of what we advocate for, talking about poverty, so having to choose between light and eating, um, talking about sexual trauma, not being able to get a, a good night's rest because you don't know who's going to come and disrupt your sleep. Um, even talking about youth organizing and youth advocacy, because the older we get, the more we acquire. So we have more to lose. And so young people really do have uh, the, the fervor and fire that we would ideally have in our organizing spaces. So when we talk about community care, I think it, 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 it really requires us to take seriously the critique that those that we serve are offering, even if we're well-intended, even if you want them to see our heart, even if they want them to see our goodwill because it's not their duty to care about what our intentions are. Um, it is our duty to make sure that the impact that we're looking to offer does not uh, further exploit those communities, does not um, kind of uh, deceive them in ways that they're used to being deceived by institutions and systems in this country. And so I cannot express enough the amount of humility and self-work that is required to do real movement work and, and do real advocacy work for me and my understanding. So when an organization talks about self-care, um, it makes me think about the community organizing unit that we are in the process of erecting. And one of the things that we really take pride in is listening sessions, where we rent out spaces, we give people food, if people need transportation assistance, we got them, if people need daycare, we got them. And we ask a series of vetted questions um, from a really curious perspective, like what are your greatest challenges? We as a nonprofit organ organization that is really the facilitator of resources from like guilty wealthy people and guilty like old rich white men that want to be like, hey, we give a damn. Um, we have to make sure that we are being good stewards of those resources and outside of the mutual aid efforts that we have, which I can share about if I remember, um, really making sure that we create spaces where people can speak to their experiences without pimping out their trauma and being serious about creating programming and services and leadership development opportunities that will speak directly to those needs. If we are talking about creating a world in which pain and suffering is a thing of the past, in which a woman can walk down the street without having to worry about being sexually harassed, kidnapped, murdered, um, in which children of all ages, of all colors, regardless of their zip code, are able to gain access to the same quality of education, then we have to be uh, bold and, and recognizing that dignity and honor has to be at the core of what we do. So with our listing sessions that we offer, we ask a series of questions, we get responses, and we work with a, a data volunteer support that helps us capture that data, synthesize it, and that then informs our organizational strategic plan, as well as our department plans, especially the ones that are external facing, um, but then also the programming that we plan to um, offer people. 
So for every time that we are looking to gather information, we want to make sure that we're circling back around to the same community leaders, to the same black captains, not just working with elected officials, but also working with leaders that are not recognized and honored by um, in, like traditional institutions in America to say, we, we heard you and we're here. And the way that um, our community, our neighbors, they're, they're not used to that. Also, we, we believe in direct mutual aid. So uh, I oftentimes talk with our executive director about a bread and roses approach. You can come with the, the best education. You can come with the best intention and leadership development. People are not going to be able to hear you if they're hungry. And that is something that I had to learn throughout my leadership development, that I can, I can empathize with the overt um, oppression that comes with being a visibly uh, a black person and a visibly a female person, I guess, depending on the eyes that you see. Um, but I did not have the direct experience of uh, poverty, of food insecurity. And so through my community organizing efforts, but also these conversations, I really had to learn that um, people, don't have, people don't have time to waste. People don't have time to, to play. And so when I talk about a bread and roses approach with our executive director in our, in our organization, we can offer people programming, leadership development, and education, but we need to make sure that their needs are met. So we actually have um, an effort called the Say Her Name Justice Fund, where initially, uh, especially because we, one of our cities is Philadelphia, we operate in Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh, and we are the only reproductive justice organization in all of Pennsylvania. But in Philadelphia, uh, gun violence is, 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 is bad. People are, are, are dying all the time. Kids on playgrounds are getting murdered. It's, it's just, um, it's sad. And so the fun initially was to cater to those that are, are impacted by gun violence, um, we were looking to provide them with funds for their final arrangements for their family members that were, were murdered by gun violence. When we received news of the leak in May, we expanded that fund to support all who are all black women and femmes and girls that are affected by state sanctioned violence, which is literally all black women, girls and femmes. So we give money directly to people that need rental assistance, people that need uh, support with their transportation, accessing the full the full spectrum of their health care, because we also operate in Cleveland which abortion is, is essentially uh, illegal in, in Cleveland now. Um, so I think, I think those are the ways that we look to care for our community. Also, when we, when we organize large events, I've never seen this before, but we have snacks, we have water, we have medics, um, we have spiritual guides, because this can be really traumatic work, especially for people who are entering kind of an enlightenment phase where they've been in survival mode for so long. And then well into their adulthood, they're talking to people that say, you deserve more. That is a very emotional um, experience for people that have never been told that and have always received either overt or very subconscious uh, subliminal messages that uh, you don't deserve anything. Mm -hmm. okay. So the second part of that question was talking a little bit more about what it looks like in practice to really center those most affected by white supremacy, patriarchy, transphobia, and poverty. Yeah, and so I, there are a lot of people that um, really talk about who's talking, who's in the room, who gets to talk on behalf of other people. And so I can really understand the frustration for um, cis women if you have a cis man that's talking about gender injustice uh, all the time and taking up those resources when really anything that they're offering is just a regurgitation <laughs> Of the, of the people that are actually impacted by the very things that we're talking about. So that is why I am always privately and publicly very critical of, of progressive spaces and well-intended people, because I think that we have to disengage with comfort, um, even again, if we, if we mean well, because any discomfort that we can experience being professors, teachers, students, lawyers, organizers, whatever you want to be, does not compare to the discomfort of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism. Um, I can never imagine what it's like to sleep on a bench outside in the winter. I can't. I can speak to, to what I've heard about the effects of poverty. Um, I can speak to elected officials, community leaders. I can speak to my organizers, community partners about the impacts. But I can never speak truly from my own experience about the impacts of poverty. And so I think it's really important for us to not just speak with each other, uh, but to make it a habit of speaking with, with those uh, that really inspire our work, uh, really motivate our work, 
And when we receive criticism, to not take offense as individuals, even as organizations, even as a movement, but to see that as an indictment on the systems that allow some of us to suffer a little bit less than others, because nobody really is, is thriving in, this, uh, in these systems, even those that think that they're at the top of the totem pole at all. Um, but I, I think it's important to do a lot of self-work. I feel like that's extremely necessary because I can imagine how frustrating it is feeling like you're trying to cater to a group of people that don't appreciate your efforts. So then I would beg the question, are you doing the work for the sake of uh, humankind and humanity, or are you doing it for appreciation? So looking at who's taking up uh, speaking opportunities, resources, somebody might not have the right clothes on, but is it about their clothes and presentation or about what they have to offer? So again, um, really constantly unlearning what we have been taught uh, matters, uh, who we have been taught deserves to be heard, and uh, divorcing ourselves from respectability politics and a lot of the, um, uh, yeah, a lot of the, the very covert ways that we dismiss people. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And Christina, now back to you and looking beyond Colombia. So in addition to the decision issued by the Colombian Constitutional Court, there have been advances elsewhere in Latin America with respect to reproductive rights in particular Argentina and Mexico, with decisions that really incorporate human rights language and frameworks in their decisions, um, expanding reproductive rights. Are there lessons learned in terms of strategies that have been used in those contexts that might be helpful for advocates here in the United States to adopt, particularly post Dobbs? Yes, thank you so much. And, and actually, this also connects with something that uh, Dula was saying uh, uh, just recently, it's really important to uh, take on into account the voices of people who normally are silenced and the need to incorporate the, those needs and those uh, expectations within these movements. And that's something important in, in, in these achievements in, in Latin America. The first that I wanted to show you is this, which is the green scarf that we use in Latin America. I guess you, you know about this. Uh, this started as, as a symbol in Argentina, uh, in which the activists were uh, speaking about these things a lot of years ago. And as a campaign, more specifically, 15 years ago, um, before having the legislation that changed um, to the to the 14 weeks in which you can access abortion to um, um, on free will in Argentina, this was uh, really important because this uh, symbol became uh, not only a symbol that united all the activists around this movement locally, but it became what now we call the green wave in Latin America, and this became a symbol for all the activists in the continent. Um, to uh, create a movement beyond a legal or a technical conversation in these issues. Uh, and for, for us, that was quite important. It was something that changed. I've been working on this for nine years now. And uh, some years ago, we had support. We had people working on this issue. But now there's more social support around this. Because once we had the green scarf, uh, it became a cause. It became a movement. And people were touched by the stories around this symbol, uh, were um, particularly touched to go outside to the streets and uh, demonstrate for this cause. And this in Latin America didn't happen quite massively before because it wasn't something that was uh, that in, in that talked about in the public eye. So definitely for us organizing and having these spaces in which as a movement you have a conversation regarding what are the objectives in which you can coordinate uh, several organizations that was important. As I told you before, in Colombia is not something that was new or something that wasn't discussed before. But the thing was that the organization were, were working on their own uh, planification, on their own hand, but we hadn't had a conversation in which all this uh, was focused on the same objective. 
and in which the organizations were able to contribute from their own knowledge and from their own, own experience to this big uh, objective. So that I think it's something quite interesting in the experience both in Colombia, also in Argentina and also in Mexico. The other thing is to be created about creative about the strategies, because as you can see in Argentina, we had a change through the Congress. And this was um, because they found in the Congress an opportunity to create a change in the law. But for us in Colombia and also in Mexico, this wasn't as easy or not easy, but it, it wasn't an opportunity there. In the case of Colombia, that wasn't a possibility because we all know that the Congress is really conservative and they would never uh, create a change through the legislation. So for us, uh, the Constitutional Court was the better option, and that's why we create an entire strategy around that. So one of the first lessons for us was also to have a clear mapping on the context and on the opportunities that you can use from that context to create a change, not only uh, legally, but also socially. So uh, definitely for us, the fact that in Argentina we had this big mobilization around it and to create a strategies to involve more people in this conversation was key to also create an effect in Colombia and in Mexico. And definitely we can feel that when we uh, have meetings with our partners in different countries in Latin America, because we start to feel uh, more mobilization around this issue and a better context around it. And I think the third one that I think worked both in Colombia, Argentina and Mexico was the fact that activists uh, used good arguments and good evidence about this issue. We already can uh, anticipate that we will have opposition groups using misinformation, creating, creating stigma and saying in, let's say it like right straight, lies about uh, how abortion is provided, who needs it, and uh, what are the reasons why people look for this uh, service. And for us, it was really important to have evidence and studies that showed why uh, this criminalization was affecting particularly those women who were living in poverty, who were in rural areas, who didn't have access to the um, uh, healthcare system. In Colombia, for example, we find out that 97% of the cases that were open for the crime of abortion were, were against women in rural areas and young women in rural areas who didn't have education or didn't have access to the healthcare system. So this, this allowed us to show during this discussion how this crime wasn't uh, preventing abortion from happening, wasn't protecting anyone, but uh, was creating a bigger distance before the, between people who are discriminated against and people who have privilege in Colombia. And this was a huge part of our uh, discussion within the country. And I think that that was the same strategy that allowed to have a better conversation around abortion within Mexico and Argentina. Uh, these strong arguments, this strong evidence provide us the possibility to uh, go with a better perspective uh, from the public. And this also created the possibility to bring these messages in different ways for different audiences. We um, care to um, bring these messages, but in a simple way in which people could relate to without trying a technical language, without being too uh, complex in the way we present it. So we care for the fact that uh, we wanted everyone involved in this conversation. So for that, we created really simple messaging to uh, compromise other people within this conversation in social media, digitally, and also in the social mobilization. And it allows us also to bring more people together around this cause. So for us, I think that was the, the better strategies. I forgot to talk before. Uh, regarding the challenges, and this connects with the, the, the things that worked for us. And it's also the fact that it's really hard to create a movement and to talk within that movement with enough time when you need to answer quickly to all the challenges and to the responses that you can get. So for us, it was uh, a challenge to have a balance between responding quickly, but also 
hearing all the people who was part of the movement and who had opinions on wh uh, what could be the better strategy to go forward with uh, the process. So uh, for us, it was uh, a matter of creating small groups that could have these conversations quickly and to react accordingly to the challenges that the context was, were, was putting there, but also to have this group uh, these bigger uh, conversations with the entire group in the movement to check if they had all the information, if they had all the messaging, if they had all the information regarding the strategy, and to check uh, their opinions regarding how the strategy was uh, carried out. Of course, I think we could do things better, and maybe there's some things that we could uh, in, uh, improve, but definitely it was a hard balance to have but it's something that is worth it when you are building up from these strategies in the context. Thank you. So we had one more question, but I think we'll go ahead and open it up to the audience for questions for either or both of our speakers. Christian. Um, I have a question for Christina. Uh, I have a question. Um, thank you, first of all, for being here with us. Um, as many people may or may not know, um, a new administration Professor President uh, Gustavo Petro uh, recently took power in Colombia. Um, this is huge because it's breaking literally decades, if not centuries, of um, right-wing um, rule, right-wing conservative rule. Um, as a fellow Colombian, um, I'm curious to see how you think that Petro's presidency um, could impact reproductive justice in Colombia and more broadly in Latin America. Were you able to hear, Christina? Uh yeah, I, I heard a little bit, but I want to check I understand well. I, I heard that it was regarding the new president in Colombia and how this could open up the possibility to have better access to reproductive justice. Is exactly. It, yeah, in Colombia and okay? also more broadly in Latin America. Potentially. Another country. Okay. Uh, for us, this was also really important. This conversation was really important because actually uh, this president, this election was defining a president who was about to uh, basically change two judges to appoint two judges in the Constitutional Court. And actually, if we didn't have a good result on the election, it could be also a scenario in which we could lose our um, majority within the Constitutional Court, and that could lead to have risk on not uh, defending appropriately our decision. So, of course, this uh, election was not only important in a general way, but also in a specific way regarding the decision and the ruling for us. Um, this uh, presidency was for us a good, uh, a good uh, news because, of course, we have a more progressive uh, government, which is at, at least uh, they've said that they are committed to reproductive rights and to the implementation of the ruling. But we need also to clarify that before that wasn't part of the of the conversation within the um, elections before in Colombia. It was the fact that this, there was this big movement talking about the issue and this big conversation that uh, in some way forced candidates to talk about abortion. And this was the first time actually that we had pre-candidates to the presidency using the green scarf and talking about abortion openly. Because this is a fact that in Colombia it's not easy to talk about. For some politicians, talk about abortion is something that is going to bring backlash for them. They don't want to talk about it. But this is the first one that we have actually congresswomen and congressmen talking openly about abortion, uh, using the scarf within the Congress, and pre-candidates to the presidency also talking about that. And also in this government, we have the, our vice president, who's the first Afro-Colombian woman who's in the in the in this charge uh, on the vice presidency uh, talking openly about feminism uh, anti-racism and also abortion and she had on uh, she was definitely a huge part of this win in in the election and she talked about she wanted to uh, enhance reproductive rights and support the implementation of the of the ruling so for us it's a really good path but we are not like be confident and not doing anything around that. Of course, we are going to be like really looking closely to this uh, government to uh, demand from them a good regulation on the on the issue and also to have a good implementation on the ruling. We think that this conversation, especially with Petro and Francia Marquez in the future, 
it's definitely creating changes also in the conversation in other countries. Uh, for example, some activists in, in Mexico told us that they were trying to change the, the legislation within their own states because you have to do that change with the ruling of the of the Supreme Court. And some of them were saying before we were thinking on 14 weeks, but now that Colombia has 24, why wouldn't we think in that? Why wouldn't we go for something bigger because Colombia already has it? So now we know that this change already is changing the conversation in other countries. And we think that's amazing because uh, this will help maybe other activists to create a different conversation on the topic also. So we are really excited to see the changes that we can create with this, but also to, to be really close to the implementation of the of the ruling because we don't feel that we won everything. Now the work has to start it and the implementation is going to be a long way and a long a, a big effort for all the, the movement. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the portrait of that in the background. <laughs> Brianna? Was about uh, using resources in relation to knowing that there's multifaceted um, applications of law. So I know Cleveland was brought up as an example, but so for instance, Cleveland's a progressive city, and usually there's some donations, like I'm just thinking like the Cleveland Foundation, etc., where it's like you could theoretically access resources, but how they are like directed to the correct communities or the communities who needed more while battling, like, okay, you have a city that's kind of working with you, but you have a state that's not working with you at all. And like the best practices and processes of trying to get people resources they need. That was to me. Yeah. I just, okay, I just wanna, yeah. No, um, I, I, I appreciate that question. I would say much of, most of my experience is in Philadelphia because I live in Philadelphia almost a decade now. But when I started heading our community organizing efforts, I spent more time speaking with leaders in Ohio and they are extremely frustrated. I mean, it's, it's actually heartbreaking because to your point, the tension that lies uh, between progressive city and state, um, when it comes to resource allocation, that is why it is so necessary to identify and honor leaders that are not recognized by traditional institutions because they know like there are, um, I think it's called block, yeah, block captains that exist. Um, the people that are not able to rush to the spaces that have resources, they know who those people are and they know how those people can be found. So that is why I really push for community organizing. And one of the questions that you asked Aya earlier were about community organizing's impact on reproductive justice. I do not believe that the reproductive justice movement has, com has a community organizing presence in the way that we can. I think that we have a lot of people that know how to do conferences and events and schmooze, but we really need to do on the ground community organizing and some of the uh, cultural work that you were talking about, Christina, letting people know that you are not lazy, you are not greedy for asking for what you need of governments that say they're here to serve you. Um, there's a lot of cultural work, individual work and, and collective work that has, happens, but to speak specifically to your question again, I think that I think that uh, appropriate and mindful resource allocation really does have to rest between those that facilitate conversations and implementation from the people that have access to resources to the people that need it. And a lot of times when you have goods that are service to marginalized communities, it's, it always feels like the creme de la creme of the marginalized communities get access to it. And that really just perpetuates the problem because then you have people saying, we gave a million dollars to this cause, what happened? And then that, again, makes people feel guilty for opting to gain access to what they need to. So that's why we're really mindful about not exploiting people's stories or pain and not pimping people out and making sure that we have a, a surefire network of uh, people that are speaking directly to the needs of those that we serve. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Of course. Other questions? you guys ensure that you can remain empathetic? Like, for instance, I work on immigration and in Pakistan with more common awareness. One of the shortcomings that I saw in my work was that I didn't empathize with the clients. Like, I sort of sometimes, like, for instance, when I read um, Sir Brian Stevenson's work or some other activists, they're, they're a lot more passionate than I was. When I was working at Illegal Clinic, I, I sort of became a bit more, uh, I would say, robotic in my work or a bit more dispassionate. But 
But like a lot of other actors, they remain passionate, they remain very, very involved, a lot more involved than I was. How do you guys ensure the same level of commitment, you know, year on year? Because human rights work is very draining, I guess. Christina, did you hear that? Oh, can we? Okay. Um, no, so, so sorry, it was really no, far away for me. <laughs> not at all. Um, so the question um, is an LLM student who's done legal aid work in Pakistan and talking about how doing human rights work over time because it can be so draining um, that you can become sort of robotic and lose some of the empathy towards those with whom you're working. And so I think the question to both of you, how do you maintain that energy and passion for the cause and for those with whom and on whose behalf you're working over time? You want to start, Christina? If Bula wants to start, maybe? Or? I can start, yes. Um, I really appreciate that question. Yeah, I really appreciate that question because it's, it's very honest. I, I think that it's a naive and purist mindset to think that we are going to sustain the same level of emotion, rage, and commitment throughout the entirety of our career. It doesn't matter what the sector is. So if you're in corporate um, and you lose passion, uh, you still get a check. But when you're in progressive spaces and you lose passion, it, it feels almost as if you're like disappointing people that need you, but it's it's human and, and it should be allowed and we should give ourselves permission to be human and have ebb and flows in this fight. I remember when I was doing communications work for uh, the racial justice organization I've referred to a number of times. And as soon as a murder happened, I was forced to come up with a statement. And I'm like, this could have been me. It could have been my brother. It, it, like, this is this is me. And so that's what I was talking about when I talked about the a lot of progressive spaces. We're expected to operate as robots when we are humans that are dealing with the, the very um, emotional effects of more trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. And so I feel like as a community, as a collective, that we allow for ourselves to engage in this work and know when it's time to disengage that would benefit the movement overall, recognizing that there is a long-term game, but there's also very short-term wins and games that we have to take seriously. And then also not seeing movement work or justice work as a career. It, it, it shouldn't be like, nobody should be like, I wanna be at this organization for the rest of my life. We should be wanting our organizations to be obsolete because we've created a world that no longer needs our observations. I mean, our organizations. Um, so I think when we approach it as human beings, as opposed to this position, this title, then that allows us to engage with this very human-centered work as humans. Christina? I agree with, uh, with you. And I think uh, also for us, I think, as you said, I think it was really important for us to feel discomfort on the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for some of us, I, for example, I work uh, mainly on strategic litigation and sometimes it could get really technical and not necessarily you have the opportunity to talk to people who you are serving. And I think, for example, local organ organizing locally and having communities talk to you, it's a really important way for us to go back to our reason, for to go back the, at the fact that why are we doing this? But in the case of the movement, it was also having uncomfortable conversations. And for us, it was to create a balance when, um, when we had disagreements because some people, for example, didn't feel quite included in the strategy. That was important and that was a conversation we did in the movement. But we care about uh, having a response to that to have that conversation, to feel uncomfortable, to create changes within the movement, to adapt to those criticism, but also to keep the messaging and the, and the way we have spoke uh, outside in a cohesive way. Because uh, this was something that we needed to talk within the movement and that created uh, a good opportunity also for the strategy to go along because for the people in the outside, Causa Justa, it's a, it's a great move and uh, they all talk about the same messaging, but within we had the conversations regarding uh, all these issues and we needed to do that because that creates changes in the strategies that are worth it and that will bring definitely new perspective and different perspectives. Uh, as an example for us also, um, the incorporation to the movement to young people was also another interesting conversation 
because there was different uh, perspectives on people who were working in this for several years and people who were just getting there. And um, the new perspectives were really important uh, to incorporate within. So of course, I think we will always have this challenge and probably we made mistakes on the, on the, on the process, but it is also important to have these uncomfortable conversations to not feel comfortable with things that we might, uh, might uh, made mistakes before. And I think it's important to actually address that and to change things in order to incorporate um, a very human perspective on the work that we do. Okay. I think that brings us to time. So thank you all so much for joining us. And a huge thank you again to Christina Mueller for joining us for this really incredible <laughs>